Hi, we are Colony 11 Sands, and we will be presenting on how can we use computational tools to analyze gene evolution within cells of heterogeneous tumors. We will ask ourselves, what is tumor heterogeneity and why is it a problem? What sequencing tools are used to do this and how do they work? What are the data sets like and how can you analyze them with machine learning? How can you analyze them with common computational biology algorithms? And lastly, how can we construct a phylogenetic tree for further applications? The idea of a tumor is very familiar to the scientific community. It is one of the most fundamental aspects of cancer. However, the term heterogeneous tumor is new in its relevance to both the computational and medical community. This is because it embodies the idea that cancerous tumors can be comprised of cells that look similar but behave quite differently. In reaching this conclusion, scientists have determined that inner tumor heterogeneity may vastly alter the way in which cancer is treated. The gumball machine image is a visual depiction of what scientists believe tumor cells look like and what recent discoveries have proved to be true. The idea of a homogeneous tumor, represented by the machine on the left, is now considered a narrow-minded approach as it has been proven that tumor cells can behave in different ways than they appear. One of the most pressing questions concerning this issue is why. Why do certain tumors behave in such non-uniform ways? The two leading explanations for this are cancer mobility and cell evolution. Since cancer is not stagnant, but instead mobile, it creates instability within its genome that can cause cell diversity. The natural evolution of cells is also a dominant contributor, as some cells are more susceptible to genetic changes and developing reversible properties. Beyond evaluating the causes of heterogeneous tumors, it is important to note the effects. With this new scientific standard, the medical community is committing a greater effort in trying to individualize patient care to better treat tumors. This is because every tumor cell composition may vary and thus multiple courses of treatment may be required. Furthermore, the diagnosis process will likely change as biopsies are only small cultures of the total sample size. Thus, they do not convey the complete cellular composition of a tumor. In order to better innovate treatment, though, it is important that the evolution of cells is better examined and understood. Every cell in an organism serves a specific purpose. These purposes are often called modules as they refer to a certain biological function. So why are organisms able to perform the same tasks even when vital cells do not survive evolution? That is because existing cells adapt to the laws by learning how to perform these necessary modules. So, while adaptive sequencing is usually the greatest cause of evolution, it is because of gene mutations that organisms can still successfully function. All organisms have biological processes that are vital to survival and thus remain unchanged during evolution. The reorganization of modules is integral in preserving these processes. An important connection that relates to cell evolution is Charles Darwin's idea of survival of the fittest, in which only the most adaptable organisms survive evolution. This translates to cell evolution because only cells that can compensate for lost components or genetic changes can withstand the stress of human progression. There are essentially two main reasons why single cell RNA sequencing may be used. The first being to compare individual cell transcripts for signs of heterogeneity. Specifically, Transcriptional differences between cells can help identify rare cell populations like malignant tumor cells that would otherwise not be detected in bulk RNA sequencing methods. The second is to provide important information about the characteristics of certain gene expressions. This includes the identification of co-regulated gene modules and even gene regulatory networks that underlie heterogeneity in specifying cell types. However, for simplicity purposes, we will focus on finding signs of heterogeneity in certain cells. 
But how does this all work? The first step in single cell sequencing techniques is to isolate cells from the tissue being sequenced. This is usually done through split, split pooling over sim simply isolating cells since it is much more cost efficient. Engineers at the University of Washington were able to analyze 156,000 single cell transcriptomes from mouse brains and spinal cords, and over 100 cell types were identified, with gene expression patterns corresponding to cellular function, regional specificity, and st stage of differentiation. Split pooling is done in rounds. In each round, fixed cells or nuclei are randomly distributed into wells and are labeled with unique barcodes. In the first round, the split cells are labeled with barcoded RT primers, which enables cDNA synthesis from all regions of RNA transcripts. This includes those that go from 3 to 5 and 5 to 3. In the second and third round, the cDNA is marked with another two sets of barcodes through ligation. This is just the process of joining two DNA strands by a phosphate ester link. Lastly, in the fourth round, another barcode is added to the cDNA molecules by PCR or a polymerase chain reaction, while the cDNA is being sequenced into libraries. However, in scRNA sequence, rounds 2, 3, and 4 are not done, since those are a part of a different scRNA sequencing method called split sequencing. Next, in the single cell RNA sequencing process, the cells are lysed so that many, RNA, many mRNA molecules are collected. The mRNA is then converted to cDNA using an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. This process is clearly shown in the figure to the right. Next, similar to round 4 in the split sequencing method, the cDNA is replicated and tagged by PCR to preserve their information on their cellular origin. There are two major processes, each with their pros and cons that can be used here. The first being MDA, or multiple displacement amplification. This specific technique provides us with accurate data, but may not cover too much of the genome. However, Malbec will provide us with great coverage across the genome, but may not be as accurate. Lastly, our pool of marked cDNA would be sequenced using multi-panel sequencing or even Sanger sequencing, which we talked about in class. As mentioned earlier with split sequencing, there are many different types of sCRNA sequencing. As of right now, there are actually about 20 different types of this form of sequencing that can each be used for their own unique purpose. As shown in the table below, each sequencing method varies in what type of data they accept, what equipment is needed, the number of cells put in, and the read, read depth. However, everything follows a similar process. When it comes to cell sequencing, we will get a lot of data, so we need to know about it. Each data set is comprised of features, which are genes, and barcodes, which are cells. Each data point is an expression of gene I and cell J. Data sets may vary with 20,000 to 30,000 features, and there are huge variants from as little as 5,000 barcodes to over 1 million. These are little snippets of the data sets, and as you can see, they're matrices with a lot of zeros and then some significant positive numbers. But not all data is perfect. It may have dropout events, where genes are expressed in some cells but not in others of the same cell type, as well as noise and high dimensionality. Now all of this is cool, but what's the actual computational problem? Well, biologists ask, given all K cells, how many cell states do we have and what are their marker genes? But how do we actually get that? How do we get from this matrix of zeros and then some positive numbers to this beautiful set of colorful clusters that can actually tell us something? Magic. Or in this case, Machine learning. Machine learning is a modern computational tool that is the intersection of latent algebra, statistics, and computer science. 
Machines learn by themselves without being explicitly programmed, which is basically magic. There are two types of machine learning, supervised and unsupervised learning, and the main difference is labels. Supervised is for labeled data, whereas unsupervised is for unlabeled data. Unsupervised learning works by finding the relations within the data sets rather than classifying things. An unsupervised learning is a problem for single cell RNA sequencing, given the unlabeled nature of the data. But wait, the dimensions. We need to reduce the number of input variables before we can actually perform machine learning on the data set. And examples of dimensionality reduction are PCA, UMAP, and TSNI. So principal component analysis, or PCA, is a feature extraction technique which creates new independent variables from selected old independent variables which combines all of the variables together, and then it orders them by how well they predict the dependent variable. An easy way to summarize this is it basically finds the variables that ha represent the most variance within the data set and keeps them. Principal component analysis specifically works by calculating matrix that summarizes how each of the data points relate or variables relate to one another and that does that by breaking down each point into direction and magnitude. Then the data is aligned and dimensionality is reduced. Another dimensionality reduction technique mentioned earlier is UMAP or Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. It works by taking a set of data points called a neighborhood, finding its k nearest neighbors, then let i represent the diameter of the neighborhood P represent the center data point to its k nearest neighbor, and then it constructs a weighted graph using those values. Then it creates a cross entropy given to its w and w prime, which is that. And then it weights the connection between. And now these are very. This is those may look like very overwhelming mathematical formulas, but really what they do is they weight the connection between each data point, apply a stochastic gradient descent, or AKA just try to find the best fit, to create a low dimensional embedding or a fuzzy graph. So, to summarize, it constructs a high-dimensional graph representation of the data, then optimizes a low-dimensional graph to be as structurally similar as possible. And the reason why it's low-dimensional is because it obviously has lower dimensionals than the high-dimensional graph. So, lastly, we can perform the actual machine learning, the clustering. So, k-means is a popular uh, machine learning clustering technique where it computes the centroid of each cluster and then minimizes the sum of the distances of all points to find the best centroid for the cluster. So, plots data point, is that the center? No. Keeps plotting until it finds the true center, which is the data point in the middle. And then there's hierarchical clustering, which we learned before with UPGMA and Clustal. And it basically groups together cells, or data points, with the same value. And in this case, it groups together cells with similar gene expression and cells with dissimilar gene expression apart. Now, the clusters actually tell us the marker genes, as I said earlier. We need to find the genes that are most significantly expressed in the data set, in the clusters. And then once we have this, we give this information to biologists or we work with biologists to find this, and they can make targeted therapy for personalized cancer treatment in order to specifically target these genes. In this presentation, we'll take a look at an algorithm first published in 2014 that constructs a rooted tree from single cell sequencing data. Although the algorithm doesn't have a name, in this presentation we'll refer to it as mud tree after the name the authors of the paper named the code of the algorithm. The mud tree algorithm developed by Kim Kai and Sim Simon R uses a likelihood-based approach to create a pairwise mutation relationship and constructs a tree using a minimal spanning tree algorithm. The tree is rooted and accounts for the time frame of mutation. The algorithm first takes the sequencing data as a matrix of mutation sites via single cells versus single cell sequencing these samples. In the case of the tested data set, the input 18 mutation sites and 58 input samples were transformed into a matrix where the value 0 denoted wild type mutations where new, no mutations, 1 denoted heterozygous mutation, 2 denoted homozygous mutations. All the samples are considered leaves in the tree since they are all sampled at the same time. All the data that were missing were excluded from the matrix denoted as a dash. 
From there, the algorithm constructs pairwise ordering of the mutation using a Bayesian-based approach and constructs a mutation tree from the pairwise ordering using a minimal spanning tree algorithm. The article, the authors of the article was kind enough to enough, kind enough to include a small sample case, an input of seven single cell sequencing samples and two mutation sites. This sample is able to demonstrate a deterministic approach towards the problem. Consider a sample one, two. These are both considered to be unmutated. As for these two samples, at mutation site X, Y, no mutations occurred. Thus, they can be set aside for now. Now look at sample three, four, and seven. All three of these samples contain mutation at site Y, but none at site X. Given the infinite site model, which states that each site can only mutate once and mutation cannot be reversed, it's fair to conclude that the mutation at site Y came before the mutation at site X, given the fact that site X is absent at this point. Thus, given the relationship between the two mutation sites, it's possible to create a tree. However, there are limited limitations with this deterministic approach, as in real life data set sequencing errors are common and the infinite site model is often disobeyed. Thus, a non-deterministic probabilistic approach is required. The probabilistic approach adapted by this particular algorithm was a Bayesian inference, where a prior model of mutation order was generated through a set number of random tree generation and the corrected upon using data from an actual data set to determine an optimal pairwise ordering. From there, given the directional pair of mutations, where mutation ordering can be determined from a pairwise relationship, a complete tree can be constructed using the assumption that the minimal span length tree is the best. This is done through a system of weighing edges that scores this length of the tree. The evolutionary tree of a tumor has many applications in both a clinical context and in a broader context in oncology. Within a clinical context, the evolutionary tree can be used to produce an index of heterogeneity in a patient's tumor, which in turn can be used to estimate the survival rates, response to therapy, and risk relapses of a patient. This is useful for doctors as this can help them better develop treatment plans and assess the situations of a patient. In addition, the evolutionary tree can be used to inform targeted therapy by directing treatments toward truncal mutations. A truncal mutation is the first mutation in a series of mutations that, lead, that can lead to cancer. It can also be used to identify the most aggressive tumor subpopulation, which can help inform targeted therapy. From the broader context of oncology, the tumor evolutionary tree can be used to trace and determine a pattern of mutations followed by tumors during the different stages of development. This can give insight to oncologists on the formation of cancer, an important knowledge that is all the less clinically oriented that is nonetheless important in the study of cancer. This could mean the distinguishing of driver and passenger mutations within tumors. Unfortunately, due to a low amount of starting material, SCS has limitations of low capture efficiency and high dropouts. In addition, it is still considered unclear what is the optimal amount of samples required to cover all mutation sites within tumor, as it's possible that small sample size completely overlook certain mutation sites. Both of these constraints would continue to be significantly impact the accuracy of phylogenetic trees constructed from single cell sequencing data. Data. In addition, many algorithms adapt the infinite site model to describe mutation sites, which states that there are infinite sites of mutation, that every new mutation occurred at a novel site, and that there are no recombinations. This model is inaccurate for the human body as it's very common that the mutation occur on a mutated site that's overhead previous mutations. Lastly, it would be very difficult to determine whether a tumor evolutionary tree generated is in fact accurate, given that it's nearly impossible to determine the tumor lineage from an experimental point of view. In conclusion, our group asked how can we use computational tools to analyze gene evolution within cells of heterogeneous tumors. In our investigation, we answered heterogeneous tumors are comprised of molecularly different cells. We use single cell RNA sequencing to gather information about these cells to produce gene expression matrices. And then a combination of dimensionality reduction and clustering is used to analyze them and find differentially expressed genes. Lastly, using the MuTree algorithm, we can construct phylogenetic trees for targeted therapy development and personalized cancer therapy for patients. Thank you!